and suffered and went through the grind of life and their children will live affluent lives. This is a cycle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's affairs. But we feel that if we are suffering financially or we have certain problems, let's not talk about it. Since when did becoming poor or acknowledging and accepting the fact that you may be poor considered a crime? The poor companions came to Rasulullah and they complained that the rich Sahaba have surpassed us. How is that? Well, they do this and we do this, they do this and we do this, but they give charity. We don't have anything to give in charity. The Prophet Muhammad honored them for they were also human beings. We don't look down on a people because they're poor. Rather, the hadith of Rasulullah states from Abu Huraira that the poor people will enter Jannah 500 years before the rich ones. And that's 500 years of tomorrow. We could do the math later. But again, we consider our financial level to be a source of weakness, hence we try to hide it and not display it. And lastly, age. Everyone wants to be 20s until they get to 40, and they want to be 40 until they get to 80. Whenever you ask the age, it's no longer how old I am, how young I am. We'll do anything and everything to mask a number. But the Holy Quran says, the Holy Quran states, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن نُعَمِّرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ Remember, we were born dependent. We could not do anything on our own. We were helpless. If it wasn't for the cries of our throats that got to the heart of our mother and she understood and interpreted that language that you are facing a discomfort you are hungry you need a diaper change huh who translated and transmitted that knowledge Allah did but then came about a time when you began to walk with your feet and make decisions with your hand which you articulated with your tongue that you thought of in your brilliant mind you thought I don't need anyone I'm independent but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in Surah Yaseen when you become old you become senile you become old you are needy only to allow you to contemplate and realize your entire life from the day you were born to the day you die you are never independent rather you are always dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but again age is considered a weakness where Allah is saying we've created you from weakness and we've created you weak if we look beyond the physical attributes of weakness that we have made and we look today to a greater weakness we will realize what is at stake today the ummah is suffering from a spiritual weakness that is plaguing our lives it is due time we open up and talk honestly. Life has now gone beyond our control. And we don't know what to do because the affairs of our lives have taken us over. How can I get a handle over things before I surrender? to the so-called autopilot of the world's ways and whims and desires. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in a verse of the Holy Quran, three areas of spiritual weakness that you and I need to be cognizant about. That if these three weaknesses come inside of me, it is much more detrimental than health, poverty, and age. Does that make sense? We're considering weakness to be these three things. 
Rather, the three that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing our attention towards need our time and focus. And they need it yesterday. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ لِقَاءَنَا وَرَضُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَاطْمَأَنُّوا بِهَا وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا غَافِلُونَ Today, the Ummah is suffering from three collective diseases. It has plagued us. Number one is called ghafla, a sense of negligence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran over and over again, وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah is not negligent of what you do. He knows what you're doing. Question should be asked, do I know what I'm doing? We are living in a society of a no-care attitude. I could do what I want to do, when I want to do, and I don't care. Either I don't care because I don't care who I have to report to or I don't be care because it's not worth my time to focus on anything that could make my life meaningful. Because I'm literally being dragged by a chain in my world today. There's nothing I could do about it. Number two is the sense of complacency. We've done enough. What else does Allah want from me? If we were to tell, if we were to tell the one that we love, the girl or the boy, I've done enough, what else do you want me to do to prove it to you? They would say, Salamun alaikum. Out you go. If you feel that whatever you've done to gain my trust or to show love in this relationship and you have the audacity to tell me what else do you want me to do, then you could see the door. This relationship with Allah is much more intense, severe, meaningful, and our life depends on it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran about those waradu bil hayati dunya biha, those who have become happy with their worldly life. They're happy and they're complacent, they're content with it also. When you have this false sense of complacency, you will be um, falling into the category of those people who Allah subhanahu wa says in the Holy Quran, وَذَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ مَا نِعَتُهُمْ حُسُونُهُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ There were a people, they thought that whatever they had was good enough, it could protect them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we all know, we all know, we can't run from Allah. We all know death will find us even if we're in a fortified fortress filled with guards that are laced to their teeth with armor. Death will slip between all of them and come to us. But why am I negligent of my Allah today? What has happened to me? Why have I become complacent? And why have I become content with whatever I've done? Because if that's my state of affairs, brothers and sisters, the Quran says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا If I'm in a time of my life where whatever I hear doesn't affect my heart, when I see something good, it doesn't make me happy. When something tragic happens within my family, it doesn't make me cry. My heart has become hard. This is a problem. Number two, if I see something that openly reminds me about Allah, and I say, I don't care, I blind myself from seeing it, I've got a problem. And if I hear continuous reminders of my Allah and it doesn't go through the ear to the brain, rather it goes in and out, through and through, I got a problem. So the weakness I'm trying to focus on today beyond age and poverty and health is a spiritual weakness that is plaguing us and what would it take for me to snap out of it? Because yes, I, am become ne I have become negligent. I have a sense of complacency and I feel content with whatever I've done that it's fine. I've done my prayers. I fasted so many months. 
performed my pilgrimage, gave my zakat. What else is there? Brothers and sisters, conditions are only going to intensify around us, in us, in our world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not punishing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not terrorizing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is waiting. He is testing you and I. He's not testing anyone else but you and I. That we turn back to Him and that we reaffirm that connection and that we reestablish that love and understanding and a wholesome lifestyle. That we become the change Allah sent us to be, not that we change to what the world wants us to be. That we become the leaders and not the followers. For that, there are four simple steps that we need to take today, inshaAllah. First and foremost, we have to focus on ourselves once again. The Ummah has lost the essence of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah number 5, verse number 105. Ya amanu, alaykum anfusakum. The world will crumble around us, but where will I fall or where will I stand? It all goes down to how much effort I make on myself. Quran says, O oh, you who believe, hold firm on to yourselves. It is due time that in order for me to get beyond this is I work on myself again. And when working on ourselves, we start doing for Allah and we don't start. We don't stop. Number one, focus on self. Number two, do and don't cease doing. Today, it's so easy for me to give up a good practice if I feel someone underestimates me, doesn't appreciate me, doesn't understand the value of what I'm doing. We are doing this only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a hadith related to us. It's recorded by Imam Bukhari, hadith number 1355, in which Rasulullah sallallahu tells us a story of a man who said, I'm going to give charity. Simple act. So I'm going to give charity tonight. So he walked out and gave charity. The next morning, it became the talk of the town. It became the gossip of the community that someone gave charity last night to a thief. And he said, I thank you, O Allah, for the opportunity of giving charity to a thief. I'm going to go tonight and give charity again. Gossip has always been there. But the drive and the dedication and the commitment is something that you have to decide. So he went out that night again. He gave charity in the morning, the tabloids, the gossip, the talk of the town was what? Someone gave charity to a prostitute. He said, Alhamdulillah for giving charity to a prostitute. I'm going to go tonight again and give charity. And he went the third night and he gave charity. And the morning, the talk of the town was, someone gave charity last night to a rich man. And he said, I thank you, O Allah, for the charity to a thief, a prostitute, and a rich man. That night he saw a dream in which he was told that you gave charity to a thief. You taught him that he can earn without taking from people. You gave charity to a prostitute. You taught her that she can make a living without doing these things. And you gave charity to a rich man. You taught him through your action that what Allah has given him, he should also share with others. So anything that I do or you do that we do is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We may not see its immediate effects, but it's happening. The thing is, are we committed to doing it or are we haphazard in it? So number one, focus on ourselves. This has to come back now. The ummah is crumbling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling on us. When will we turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number two, we have to do with dedication and commitment without ceasing. Number three, we have to believe. We have to believe in what we're doing. The soul of Islam is dead today. It's gone. I don't feel motivated to do anything. We see opportunities arise around us to give sadaqah, to do some good, to make a change. But you know what? I don't need to do it. 
Someone else will do it. Why has the spirit of Islam fallen dead today? What has happened to it? What has happened to that commitment and belief that Imam Ahmad has recorded from Suhaib ta'ala that the Prophet Muhammad said that before your time, and the story is long and I'll summarize it, there was a king and he had a sorcerer. We know the story. The sorcerer was dying. He asked the king, send to me a bright young lad who I can teach this sorcery and I can incorporate my knowledge into him before I die. So he used to go to the sorcerer every day and learn about magic. It is said that on his way to and back home from the palace, he would always meet a man on the street. And the man would teach him about Allah. One day this beast was in the middle of the road, preventing the people from passing. And he said, I'm going to test my faith today. I ask you and I pause here. If I was told to test my connection with Allah, what can I get from that? What can I get from that? He picked up a stone and said, Oh Allah, if the knowledge that the man is teaching me is the truth, is the truth, remove this beast from the road. He threw it, the beast was gone. He became the talk of the town. When the ministers of the king found out, one said, I'm blind, use your magic and bring back my sight. He said, I don't do nothing. Allah does everything. Who is Allah? He is my Lord and your Lord. He brought faith. He made dua. His sight returned. When he was in front of the king the next day, the king said, you got your sight back. He goes, yeah, that child brought it for me. Man, that magic is really working for him. Call him to me. So he said, well, looks like things are really progressing here. He goes, no, I'm not doing anything. Allah is doing everything. Long story short, he killed that man, his minister. He then found out about the teacher who was teaching the child and he killed him. The hadith says he made two pieces out of that person. And then he said to the child, I'm going to put you in a position where the world will remember never to mess with me. He sent a chunk of his army. They said, take him to the top of the mountain and throw him off. When he got to the top, armies are laced with their weaponry. He said, Allahum makfini bihim. Allahum makfini bihim. If I said to my Allah today, Oh Allah, you suffice for me against them. Simple, one dua. Oh Allah, you suffice for me against them. Will my Allah respond to me? But there's a difference between the words and the actions. What this child did is what he believed, what he knew is what he lived. And it said the mountain shook, they all died. He came back to the king. He said, believe in Allah. He sent his army with him out to the ocean, throw him over when he got there in the middle of the ocean. The, he said the same dua, oh Allah suffice for me. And the boat toppled, they all drowned. He came back to the king. And he said to the king, you want to kill me, right? I'll tell you how to kill me. Gather the entire community. Gather the entire community and take my arrow and my bow and say in the name of this child's Allah, I am killing him. So the king did it. And once the king did it, the child got hit in the temple and the child died. And upon dying, the whole community said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. They all brought faith on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because his actions continued forward. I pause here and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to revive the soul of our Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our sense of complacency and negligence and contentment and allow us to strive harder and more, uh, more rigorous so that we can gain that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the entire creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could restore that connection with Him. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله. Brothers and sisters, I want you to turn your attention now to Surah number 85. The name of this king, Dunas, Zohra was his name. It is said that he had commanded then for a fire to be lit, for a ditch to be dug, and for a fire to be lit. These were the people of Himyar, the people of Yemen. 
And the Quran displays this entire story. Surah number 85. When you go home tonight, read it. In one morning, he killed 20,000 of them. And when he was killing them, he was giving them the option renounce your faith, and I'll spare you. It is written in the books of Tafsir that there was a mother who had just given birth and her baby was a suckling baby. At that time she was hesitant and the baby spoke, Isbiri ya ummi fa innaki ala al-haq. Oh my mother, be patient, move forward, you're on the truth. My dear brothers and sisters, the ummah is being tested. The ummah is being shaken. The ummah is being cut into pieces only because of the fact of what they profess and what they believe, like our brothers and sisters in Burma. Quran is reliving itself in our time. The question is, why isn't this shaking me? Why isn't this changing me? For that, and these four steps that we presented today, our solution is in number four. Let us go back to the Holy Quran. Let us go back to at least touching the Quran every day. Let us go back to at least opening the Quran for two minutes, 120 seconds. Open the Quran and look at it. For there are three things in our Islam that by looking at it alone, you get reward. Number one is your parents. Number two is the Kaaba. And number three is the Quran. Let us open these Qurans that have gained dust in our shelves in our masjid every day we come here and rejuvenate our souls and connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I remind you that the Quran will say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in surah number 25 verse number 30 on the day of judgment on the day of judgment the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will say وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Oh my Allah, my people had discarded the Qur'an. They had disconnected from the Qur'an. May Allah not make us or our children or our parents from amongst them. May Allah protect us from those people who discarded the Qur'an, who were negligent of the Qur'an and they lost in this world and they lost in the next. Allah subhanahu wa telling us in order for us to gain wajahadu bi amwalikum wa anfusikum when Allah says strive and make effort you need to make physical effort as you make monetary effort yes we are doing great things with our money and our resources we have to do equal effort with our body we send salutations upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam who not just instructed us or informed us but rather he lived it for us and showed that it is possible for us to live it too as Allah subhanahu says in the Holy Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima, Allahumma fasalli wa sallim wa barik ala sayyidina Muhammad, abdika wa rasulika al nabi li ummi, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran kathira. اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا واسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم أرنا الحق حق وارزقنا التباع وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابا اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والإسيان وجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم إنا نسلك العفو والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في ديننا ودنيانا وآخرتنا نسألك اللهم من الخير كله عاجله وآجله ونعوذ بك اللهم من الشر كله عاجله وآجله اللهم اشف مرضانا وعاف مبتلانا وارحم موتانا يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين آمين يا رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون السلام عليكم a few announcements, inshallah. First off, uh, we have a community member, Sister Farhina. Her father passed away. We'll make a dua for Allahumma gfir lahu wa rahamahu wa afihi wa afu anhu wa akrim nuzulahu wa wasi'a madkhala. May Allah Ta'ala make his grave a garden among the gardens of paradise. Ameen. Uh, this Sunday, inshallah, 